Today we are going to give an uh, overview of cardiac IVC and we've thrown in beelines because I think uh, the idea there is that they're going to relate to your resuscitative ultrasound. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about those uh, and what the significance of beelines are. Um, our main objectives today are going to be uh, to learn the four views of the cardiac examination and talk about some of the sort of nuances involved there. Uh, learn the two views of the inferior vena cava examination, review some normal and abnormal findings for both of those, uh, and then review beelines and in particular just sort of speak to their clinical relevance um, when you're doing a resuscitative ultrasound. Um, so first up, cardiac pocus. So as you guys are well aware, um, you're looking for a probe that's going to look fairly deep with the, your cardiac ultrasound. So typically we're using a phased array probe. Uh, you can also use one of these curvilinear probes, though probably your phased array in almost all circumstances is going to be um, a more ideal choice because it gets between those rib spaces. But in a pinch, you can certainly use uh, more like your curvilinear deeper probe. Um, as far as uh, positions, um, there's sort of three positions, but four views because the parasternal long and short are basically going to be through the same window. Um, your four chamber is going to be uh, more around the kind of nipple line uh, at the fourth or fifth intercostal space, um, pointing up towards the apex of the heart. And then your sub xiphoid is sub xiphoid, um, pointing again up towards the heart. Um, quick things to point out. Not so much because it's relevant for what we do day to day, but because you'll see videos from around the world um, and have to kind of interpret uh, images or you'll have people who train with us who come from abroad and may have seen images that look kind of different from ours. This is what we're used to seeing, of course. This is a um, standard uh, setup for a U.S. or Canadian EM uh, trainer who has the probe marker on the left side of the screen. Um, that is sort of correlating with that uh, aortic outflow tract. Um, whereas if you are from uh, the UK world or you're a cardiologist here, you're actually doing the exact same thing, but your probe marker is on the opposite side of the screen. So it's on the screen, not on the patient. Um, and so your view is just flipped. So it's literally just flipping that screen. Um, just to confuse things a bit further, some cardiologists will also be looking at the heart from sort of this um, upside down view. Um, important to note too, because when you use the machines, sometimes if you go into a setting that isn't your sort of cardinal um, cardiac setting and you've gotten there in some precipitous way or your machine's just been updated with you know the software or had a you know recent malfunction, you sometimes find that when you load your, your um, images, um, this is what will pop up and you'll go, what the hell's going on here? So um, in a pinch, I suppose you could try and familiarize yourself with these things, but obviously ideally use the image that is most familiar to your eyes. Um, but be aware that on Twitter and other places, when you see videos posted, they may actually be posted in these formats. So for us, um, our typical fashion of going through a cardiac ultrasound is going to be uh, typically to start with something like the parasternal long. I mean, you can talk about whatever order of ultrasound you want to do it in, but uh, this ideally isn't taking very long uh, and probably most would contend starting with the parasternal long is a good first choice because it's really going to give you, I think, the most information in terms of function as well as potentially effusion um, and some sort of anatomy uh, determinations. Um, so you're first going to start with your probe in that sort of uh, parasternal space in the second or third intercostal space. Um, everyone's going to be slightly different, so there's no sort of hard and fast rule about exactly where the probe has to be, um, because depending on the individual's anatomy and their age and their body habitus, that's going to be different for each person. Um, your probe marker is going to sort of generally be pointed towards the right shoulder. Um, when you move to doing your parasternal short, you're going to just rotate typically within the space that you're already in to point that probe marker towards the right hip. And then you're going to slide typically down from that spot. You don't necessarily have to take the probe off the patient's body down to that fourth or fifth intercostal space, um, right around where the nipple is or just under there. Uh, and then tilt your probe back up towards um, the patient's right shoulder. So in this case, the probe is pointing towards the patient's right shoulder, but the marker is pointing towards the right hip. Um, 
we don't really need to talk so much about the uh, par or, or the sub xiphoid in that case, uh, as that's sort of uh, pretty straightforward in terms of uh, your view. As far as um, our colleagues around the world, as well as our cardiology friends, they actually start their ultrasound the exact same way as us, although their image is flipped, so their probe marker is still pointed to the patient's right. However, since their parasternal short and their sub xiphoid and their four chamber look the same as ours, they actually do some other sort of tweaks to the way they're doing their uh, approach. So they'll start the same way in the parasternal long, but then they'll rotate to the patient's left shoulder, meaning that the image that's flipped is going to look the same as ours because they're now rotated towards their shoulder as opposed to their hip. Um, and then they'll slide down the chest so that the probe marker in this case is again pointed towards the left shoulder, not the right hip. Is that confusing enough for you guys? Mm -hmm. um, okay, perfectly. So, so at the end of the day, we should learn the way that we're comfortable with and we should uh, continue to do it that way, but just be aware that people are gonna be coming in from different places with different kind of trainings. First, we're gonna talk about sub xiphoid view. Um, so this view is gonna really be our uh, main view when we're looking for things like effusion, not something we typically are gonna use to talk about in terms of function of the heart, though obviously you're gonna get some indications in any view you look at if there's severe dysfunction. Um, so a normal view of this is going to be pointing up from the xiphoid space towards the heart. Typically, we want to think about holding the probe very uh, shallow against the chest um, or the upper, upper, upper abdomen, I guess it would be, um, and often having to use quite a bit of pressure and um, pushing into that upper abdomen to get our view. Sometimes we have to push air out of the way. Uh, I usually think about trying to get the liver in front of the heart in this case. Um, as much as possible so that you can kind of min minimize the amount of kind of gastric contents that might be um, occluding your view. Um, here you can see the liver up at the top and then our right ventricle, left ventricle and the two atrium. Um, so just keep in mind that sometimes, you know, when you're doing these sub xiphoids and four chamber views in particular, you can kind of get misled about which, which chamber is which, um, but keep in mind if your probe marker is pointed towards the patient's right, um, then the, the right most thing on your screen is going to be the, or sorry, the left most thing on your screen is going to be the right side. So it's just don't, don't confuse yourself. Over time, this becomes quite simple because you've seen a lot of images, but for novices, it can be a bit tricky sometimes to point out which ventricle is which. Um, so why do we do this? Well, um, I mean, what do you guys see in this, this ECG? Um, any comments? Does it look normal? Is there something in particular? Yeah, so very good. So, so the voltage is low. This is historically probably our best way of knowing if someone's got an effusion. You can talk about, you know, pericardial rubs and diminished heart sounds and this sort of stuff, but that stuff becomes very um, challenging, I think, especially like in this really day and age when clinical activity. skills are probably not quite like William Osler's. Um, and so, uh, you know, this was historically probably our best way of knowing at the bedside for, you know, so putting aside things like echocardiograms or whether you're going to send them for an x-ray and this sort of stuff, um, whether there's something going on with the patient's heart. Um, whereas now, I mean, you have some concern about their clinical status and you want to look at their heart and you see something like this, you've got your answer well in advance, right? So, so what are we actually seeing in this image? You guys want to start commenting a little on this? Yep. So lots of pericardial Huge. fluid. Um, and what do you think about the heart itself? Does it, uh, are you concerned at all? The contractility is poor. Yeah. So it's beating quite quickly, but there may actually be some uh, free wall collapse in diastole here. And I apologize, it's kind of hard to slow the video down to, to really show you all that. Um, but if you, if you watch really closely, you can kind of see that that right ventricular free wall is kind of at times like what we call um, uh, trampolining inwards and, and sort of pushing inwards during diastole, which is unusual. It should really be more of a concentric motion. Um, at the end of the day, you seeing that is probably less important than you identifying the effusion, right? So identifying the clinical status of the patient who's in front of you, identifying what the problem is, um, is much more important than, you know, being very clear about whether there's potentially tamponade because the heart is usually going very quick. If you ask cardiologists, they're using a lot more sort of um, quantitative measurements of doing these sorts of things. But um, if you know about some of those potential uh, 
findings during the, the ultrasound, it's, it's also kind of useful for you as well.